rotation movement that during the course of treatment. So the treatment with all these things, this treatment becomes as precise as what we do the frame base. Frame-based uh, frame radiosurgery, frame radio and we have also compared, we have done an analysis whether this frame-based is equivalent to this uh, frame-based and we find, uh, find out that there is hardly any difference between the two technologies. So, with this uh, new technology, we, are, we have not to put these nails we, and we are able to deliver as precise as treatment which can be delivered this frame-based. And also with the advent of this technology, initially the radio surgery was just limited to the brain, now we have moved from the brain to the body, other parts of the body also. So moving on to the indications of radio surgery, there are multiple indications in which cranial indication in which this radio surgery can be used. We will discuss few of them in next few slides. So first of all, uh, trigeminal neuralgia which comes into the context of functional radio surgery. In this, what have, uh, the most common cause of this uh, uh, the most common cause of this uh, trigeminal neuralgia, which is a pain in the distribution of trigeminal nerve, is uh, basically there is some abrupt vessel which causes constant rubbing and irritation, causes facial pain. And the initial management of this is basically a medication. But if the patient is not controlled with the medication, there are certain other treatment. We'll see in the next few slides. This is the most common indication, uh, most most common cause of trigeminal neuralgia. There are certain other cause like uh, that there is meningioma or certain other pathology which causes the irritation of the trigeminal nerve. So, this is the aberrant vessel which causes the constant rubbing of the trigeminal nerve which causes demyelination and re-demyelination and which further causes the pain in the distribution of trigeminal nerve. These are basically more aggravated with the spontaneous touch, facial movement or facial movement. These are the trigger, trigger factors. These are the secondary causes of the trigeminal. I will not go into the detail. So, what I discussed is initial treatment was the medication. If the patient is controlled with the medication, then patient needs to continue a medication. But if the patient is resistant to this medication, then the next line of management is microvascular decompression. And if it is not possible, then the SRS comes into the play. So, what are the indications of SRS in trigeminal neuralgia? If the patient, if the patient is medical inoperable and does not want any invasive procedure, or the patient is surgically or medically refractory. So, what happened in functional uh, in treatment of trigeminal neuralgia? In this, you required a very high doses, very high doses, which is to, which is to the tune of 70 to 90 gray. Normally, if you see a patient of hand neck cancer, this 70 gray of the treatment we give over a period of seven weeks. But for the ablative kind of dose, 70 gray, you have to give in a single fraction. And if you just miss the target, then the entire treatment is failed. So if this is a very high dose. And if you just miss the target, you are end up giving a lot of toxicity to the patient. So this is where the trigeminal nerve, we, this is a MRI sequence in which you can see this is how the trigeminal nerve start from the brain stem and this is the target area which we fire with the radiation. And with the 70 degree of radiation, you can see the, what cyclonite does. There is sharp all of those. So, if we are giving 70 degree radiation to this, so with every 1 millimeter or 1.2 millimeter, we have almost 50 percent dose fall off. So, suppose if we are delivering 50 degree radiation to this area, and at the 0.5 centimeter or 1 centimeter, you have a dose which is uh, 10 to 12, 12 gray. So this is within the certain uh, within, within the certain tolerance limit of the surrounding critical structure. This is what cyberlife do. So a very sharp fall of dose beyond the target, which we can achieve. You can see the 70 gray of radiation in the CT scan was delivered to the target, but uh, less than 10 gray dose to the periphery. So you can see a very sharp fall of dose in this group of patients. And what are the results which we can, which we see with the trigeminal? Which it has been very well reported in the literature, and it is to the tune of the pain control was to the tune of 80 to 90 percent. And the uh, approximately 40 percent of the patient do respond within the first 48 hours, but the maximum patient do respond within the 30 days of treatment. And uh, uh, next slide, this slide show how this uh, cyber knife is superior to gamma knife. You can see on the left side. This is the patient. This is the same patient uh, image which has been uh, planted on the gamma knife. You can see there are certain cones. There are no sector blocking in the gamma knife. 
So you can see the 24 grade dose which is giving going to the brain stem, even the best possible of the planning. But with cyber like we are able to modulate in such a way that we can take away the dose from the brain stem. So the maximum dose which is in the brain stem is 24 grade is reduced to 12 day with the cyber knife. So it is much safer as compared to gamma knife. There are certain other indications like acoustic neuroma in which we know the swan cells, the tumor originate and it, is, it appears on the CT or in the MRI is like an ice cream cone appearance. This is how the grading was done. But previously the treatment of choice uh, for the acoustic neuroma was, was surgery. But the surgery was associated a lot of problem like hearing loss, facial nerve damage. This is a lot of complication. Now, uh, if you can see this treatment, uh, this is treatment you do in which you can find that for a small acoustic schwannoma, if the uh, SRS is the treatment of choice, if the uh, surgery remains the treatment only in the patient, if the tumor size is more than three centimeter, it is cystic or it is compressing the brain stem, and in such cases. Even if you do surgery, you are not able to completely excise the treatment. So post-op, there is some residual which can be taken care of radio surgery. This is one of our patients in which you can see the uh, acoustic schwannoma on the right CP angle, which we have treated with three fraction. And you can see the dose we have prescribed around 19.5 and less than 5 grade dose, which is to the surrounding structure. So we are able to take out dose from all the critical structure which is surrounding area, so even to the cochlea, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. And uh, if you can see, this is another example in which we have treated a left cycle, uh, left sided of acoustic schwannoma. And this is post treatment response you can look like. Sometimes the patient or the doctor get confused that the size remains the same, what was pre treatment. But you need to take a look at the post radiation changes which are there inside the tumor. In necrosis, you can see the black, black spot within the tumor. And we have correlated this uh, black area within the tumor with a Isodose. So we produce a normally a high dose, 70 to 80 percent high dose inside, and which is now which is correlated with this necrotic area. This is another example of acoustic schwannoma which we have treated, and you can see the necrotic area and the complete inactive tumor which is sitting there, and it is completely cured patient. So the literature also suggests the control rate with the SRS is more than 95 percent at 10 years and hearing preservation is much better and superior as compared to surgery and the facial laser preservation rate are much better as compared to surgical series. Another is pituitary adenoma. We know that there are two types of adenomas. One is functional, second is non-functional and not going to the detail. But where the radio surgery comes into play? Uh, if you see if it is a non surgery non-functional, then you do the surgical resection followed by radio surgery for the resident tumor and if it is functional, even in cases of other than prolactinoma, you do the surgical resection and if there is a residual, the radio surgery comes into play. But if prolactinoma, you give certain agent that take care of your uh, prolactin secretion. If not, then surgical resection followed by radio surgery. So for, for even for secretory, non-secretory, everywhere, the radio surgery has a role to play. So the literature also suggests if you do give addition to this group of patients, the control rate is at 10 years, 15 years or 20 years, it must superior as compared to the patient who has not given radiation uh, treatment post uh, surgery. And there are few important points which you need to remember that you need, if the patient has undergone surgery, you need to wait at least for 3 months because there might be a flap, there might be something. So you need to wait so that surgical changes get repressed. You can see this is limited. Uh, post-op and the uh, three month post-op there is a regression of post-op changes so if you treat at this point of time you might end up treating a large volume so for primary SRS if the patient is inoperable then you can consider SRS or FSRT fractionated SRT in cases of pituitary if the surgical is defibrillated or patient is refused refuse surgery then the SRS comes also comes into the play this is one of our patients, you can see the large tumor which we have treated. It is not possible to treat this patient because of the with, uh, proximity of the optic cap. So we have treated with high fraction. And you, you can see how we are able to save, uh, remove the doses from the brain stem and the temporal doses. Temporal doses. And this is one of our patients in which we have treated with three fractions. You can see the large tumor and post treatment six months and post treatment two years. The regression as well as the activity has gone down significantly. 
So if the patient is you know touching the optic cap, I have already told you that SRS is not an option. You might have to fractionate maybe five fraction or maybe a 25 seconds of radiation you need. And the important point which is need to be remembered, if the if you want if there is a compression of optic cap or there is a compression symptom, then radio surgery is not going to relieve your symptom immediately. It takes time to act. So you need to if the patient has compression symptom, then surgery is the standard of choice. So these are the guidelines which normally we follow by prescribing in cases of pituitary. Or this is for non-functional. This is for functional. And the control rate, control rate is more than 90 percent, and endocrine radiation rate is more than 50 percent with the radiation rate. Another important indication is AVM. In this, there are abnormally developed artery and vein with capillaries, and these are the presenting symptoms of AVM. And normally, we use SM grading for grading this AVM. And where does radio surgery come into the management of AVM? If the patient has small volume lower location, then you do the surgery, if it is operable, then gradual AVM can be taken care of radio surgery. And if it is located small, well, but it is located in deep or locate area, then radio surgery is the first line of treatment. But if, if, if the AVM is large, you might need to do a stage radio surgery, or you might need to embolize to reduce the size and followed by radio surgery. And in patients who are trying, who does not want any surgical indication or embolize, radio surgery can be offered in this report. And what are the good why the radio surgery is good option? Because there is no functional brain tissue within the nidus. There is a gliding zone where you can put your additional doses and take care of the brain doses. And there is a 50% risk of reduction in bleeding during the radiation period. And these are the doses normally which we follow depending on the volume and what we can you know prescribe depending on the normal uh, normal brain doses. At the, uh, as I already discussed, if the uh, patient volume is large for the AVM, you might have to do a stage radio surgery in which part of AVM can be treated up front, followed by 3 to 6 months down the line, the rest, rest, or rest of the part of the AVM can be taken care of. And this is the data of recent analysis which clearly shows us that SRS is favorable for, for the benefit for the appropriately selected patient. This is one of our paper which in which we have find out that the for uh, radio surgery with a cyber you need a volumetric imaging. But sometimes it is very difficult to delete the images. So we deconstructed this uh, 2D angiogram which is not able to you, you cannot able to use in the cyber -like planning. So we have reconstructed that uh, CT to the Dyna CT then able to delete better uh, uh, target volume and treat the areas. Another indication is meningiomas and SRS is commonly used for meningiomas upfront or maybe a host of residual disease. These are the prescription dose of the meningioma depend on where the lesion is located, how large is the lesion and what if whether it is prior radiation reliever or not. It can be treated with a single fraction or multiple fraction. These are the indications of meningiomas. This is the image of one of our patient in which we have treated post-op meningioma and 25 grade 5 fractions. This is a this is one of our interesting case. This is a case of brain stem cavernoma which cannot be taken care of with the surgery. So patient has in, uh, severe involuntary movement pre-treatment and as the surgery cannot be done, the patient unable to lie down and this is constant movement which is the patient is having uh, 24 hours a day. So what we have done the radio surgery to this patient and you can see the post treatment response. The tremor has gone and patient can be able to move the limbs, hold the limb without any tremor. And patient is able to walk without any support. And this is the image of the patient. This is a raised and cavernor which was located and it was treated with a single fraction of 16 grade. And you can see the post, uh, post treatment changes in the images. Another common indication now is in which the radio surgery is used is brain stem, uh, brain metastasis, which is the most common indication nowadays for radio surgery in which you can just focally treat the brain metastasis maybe up to 5 or 10 and you can spare the hippocampus and the rest of the brain. So the cognition of the patient remains uh, intact post-treatment. This is another example. 
this is one of the interesting cases in which the metastasis is located to the brain stem and we are, this is a single site of metastasis so we are treated with a radio surgery with a good response. Another indication is skull based for Roma, which is commonly used for doing the radio surgery. So in the last, the most important take home message is machine is important for delivering the treatment but it is it needs to be remembered that man behind the machine is also important. You can have the machine with, with which you can deliver the treatment safely but the understanding of machine optimally utilize the where, can, where it can be used, where it can be not be used, it is important to remember. So the most important thing, the man behind the machine is also important, not only the machine which is doing the everything. So there are certain, these are the indications which we have already discussed, trigeminal neuralgia, acoustic, primary, uh, pituitary adenoma, meningioma, ABM and brain metastasis. With this, I'd like to thank you, thank you all for patient Dr. Ritesh. So, uh, for all of us, because I am also part of the radio or additional quality team, so basically what CyberKnife is doing is that we are delivering high-dose radiation with minimal damage to the surrounding structures, which was initially not possible because to give radiation to high-dose, the surrounding structures would be receiving radiation, so hence we could not escalate the dose. Now we are able to escalate the dose and meanwhile we are able to reduce the dose to the surrounding structures, hence we are able to get a very good response. So here lies the utility of CyberKnife. And uh, we will also discuss a couple of things once Dr. Shyam completes his uh, presentation. So now I invite Dr. Shyam to uh, have his presentation on uh, extra cranial stereotactic radio. Uh, So that is all about. So this is a cyber knife robot just 
I will show you a small dance of this. This is how the robot can dance. That means it can maneuver, it can move around in different directions to exactly so that the other machines they can't move much. So it can be a robot, commercial robot. So coming to the first uh, indication, lung, I have divided lung into three parts. First is, this is a lady which is having a very CPU, uh, severe COPD, uh, COPD gold a uh, 3. She was not able to do the uh, PFT. You can see the lungs, how damaged they are. Can you see the lungs? So they are very damaged lungs. She is not able to do a, even a pulmonary function test. And on uh, PET scan there was, on the chest X-ray, her physician detected a nodule in the lung. So since the lung were highly damaged, so even the biopsy during the intervention radiologist doing a biopsy was ruled out because of the high risk of complication. So we can see on a PET scan there was a nodule in the left uh, right apex. So there is we know there is on PET CT there is an active nodule on the lung apex. Lungs are very really bad. Nobody wants to do a biopsy or even FNAC. What to do? So based on the PET scan, are there any indication where we can treat this patient? We know it is carcinoma, but we don't have any evidence of stating it is a carcinoma, it is a malignancy, we know for sure. But there is no proof of malignancy, there is no histological proof or cytological proof of malignancy. So still, can we treat this patient, so you must be facing this kind of patients in your uh, practice uh, quite oftenly. So there are guidelines, they are calculated which take into account the location of the lesion, the size, population and then they give a a calculation that is called pretext probability of malignancy. That means what is the probability of having a malignancy? This is a Mayo calculator. So in this patient this is 93.8% probability of having a malignancy. So what do we do with this percentage? So they are like um, ISALC, um, US chest physician guidelines, there are different guidelines which say if the, the probability of malignancy or cancer is more than 65%, you can go for an empirical treatment. This lady will for, uh, for sure will not go for surgery. Chemotherapy is not an option. So only thing is a radio surgery or conventional radiation. Conven conventional radiation results are very poor. So the option is a radio surgery. So this is one of our patients. So we went for radio surgery for this patient. Based on this calculator, based on the guideline, we say if the probability of cancer is more than 65%, you can go for radio surgery. So this is before radio surgery. This is after radio surgery, 4 months post uh, radio surgery and then you can see a 1 year follow up and a 30 months follow up of this patient. Without any surgery, without any chemotherapy, without any immunotherapy. So this is the beauty of radio surgery. So this was in patient where we could not do the biopsy. In patients who are like medically inoperable, we have done the biopsy or FNAC, we have found it is a cancer, it is a um, Adenocarcinoma or squamous carcinoma of the lung. But patient is having a severe, severe uh, COPD or cardiac issue, stenting, bypass, all those issues. Uh, the patient cannot undergo a surgery. That means medically contraindicated for surgery. So uh, even uh, for the RFA or intervention, uh, radiation intervention, uh, IR techniques like MWA, radio frequency ablation, microwave has been tried. But you can see 42% control rate of all these intervention uh, technique versus 86 percent with radio surgery. Even the conventional radiation is failed in this. So I will show you next. So whenever we talk about the, about the lung radio surgery, this is the person who has um, brought us here, Robert Timmerman. He was at Indiana University. He did a lot of. If you search for radio surgery lung, Robert Timmerman is the first Google search in there. So he did a lot of studies. And he, because of his work, it showed more than 90% control rate in the lung primary. Around 5 till 5 centimeter lung tumor, more than 90% control rates. So he did a phase, um, pilot study, he did phase 1 study, he did phase 2 studies. And there are a lot of RTOG international studies from US and European centers. So because of his efforts, now radio surgery is the standard treatment or the first line treatment on patients who have lung cancer up to 5 cm medically inoperable. So standard of care for medically inoperable stage 1, stage 2 lung cancer is SBRT. We use the word SBRT also. Radiosurgery, SBRT, SABR. These are all synonymous. 
So even if you see the NCCM, even latest also, it has been from last five six years. NCCM guidelines is the is the topmost guidelines when we come about the oncology. So you can see the first line or standard treatment for lung cancers up to five centimeters, which are medically inoperable. No other option, no RRP, no MWA, just radio surgery. And important thing is like for in for radio surgery, you don't need to have a good PFT. I showed you that lady, she was not able to do a PFT also. So PFT is not. PFT, cardiac factors, they are the, um, they, uh, they are required for doing a surgery, but not for radio surgery. So when Robert Tiverman did the experiments, he did the trials on the lung radio surgery, he found very good results, right? But the tumor which were very close to central structures like trachea, bronchus, he had, uh, he observed almost 9% death in this trial. So 9% death is a very big number. So 9% death and 46% uh, high grade toxicity. And even uh, if you see NEGM, there is a case report where one of the ex-mayor of uh, one of the uh, cities of Britain, he died because of radio surgery, because the tumor was central. So, so he told that the peripheral tumors or away from the central structures are very uh, safe. But when you uh, treat with radio surgery, the central tumors, even central tumors doing the surgery is also very different uh, along trachea and bronchus. So this gave to the concept of no-fly zone. That means he advised it is no-fly zone. Don't try to experiment in the central zone. But subsequently, other studies were done where they found there is a very famous study, R2OG 0813. This study told us earlier when they were doing the uh, robot development that he did in uh, one to three fractions central tumors, but he burned his fingers. So these studies they have shown that when you treat the central tumor, radio surgery is still possible, but you have to give in maybe three ses five sessions or seven sessions. So that means central tumor also you can do radio surgery, but you increase the number of fractions. So, so this is one of a case of uh, ultra central tumor. Central is central is which are close to trachea bronchus. Ultra central which are just touching upon the uh, trachea bronchus. So this is one of the um, patient we did. So we have done a lot of uh, ultra central tumor radio surgery. So this is how the no fly zone become a very carefully cycle. You can fly there, but with your appropriate gears, but it can still fly. Now coming to the th um, in lung cancer, what about the small lung cancer which are operable? This is a, a point of debate. Last year I had a debate in Indian um, Thoracic Surgery Conference with Dr. Rama Mohan from Manchester University. So it was a debate about early lung, small lung cancer, surgery or radio surgery. This was the topic of debate. Although there was an equipoise, but when we talk about the operable, there were three large international randomized trials started in Europe and America. So because of the non, what you say, non-cooperation from the surgeons or whatever, the trial could not be uh, completed because of the poor accrual. So these two, Robert, uh, uh, Jack Roth and uh, Chad, one is radiation oncologist, other is the thoracic surgeon. So they did a pooled analysis of all those two trials because independently the, the number of patients were not sufficient. So they combined these both these trials with theirs. And they found this is you can see the blue line is for radio surgery and the red line is for surgery. They had around approximately around 60 70 patients, and all these were randomized patients, minded they, because these two trials were started. They were recruiting patients, they were randomizing, but they could not be completed because of the uh, full patient, they could not get the full patient in the uh, in that duration. So, all those randomized patients were around uh, compiled, and this is a very landmark article published in Lancet Oncology. So in this, if you just believe in this um, graph, it says radio surgery is better than the surgery. But since it's the number is insufficient, but at least we can say there is an equipoise or tie between surgery and radio surgery in case of small lung cancers which are medically operable. There is no debate about inoperable, it is radio surgery. There is no debate about when you cannot do biopsy, it is radio surgery. But what about the operable? In case of operable, there is an equipoise between radio surgery and surgery in case of uh, smaller lung tumors. That was the debate I had with Dr. Ramamohan from Manchester. So these are few cases of small lung tumors. They vanished with radio surgery. And you can see the uh, long term follow-up. 
different patients. This is the 44. We had now we had this was this slide is almost around six eight months back. Now we are around six, even seven eight, eight months eight years follow up of the small lung cancers. You can see a 44 months follow up. You can see a good fibrosis there. Now even we can treat with a single fraction, single session radiosurgery. We have tried in our setup. We have couple of cases. Single session radiosurgery, 34 units of radiation. These are uh, two cases which we did till um, I think uh, September, October. And uh, now the fourth in lung cancer is a tumor which are very big, like more than five centimeters. Till now I was talking about five centimeters. Now more than five centimeters. Many times we see tumors six centimeters, seven centimeters. No nodes. Patient is not fit for chemo radiation because for large tumors, along with nodes, standard is chemo radiation. But if the nodes are not there, either a surgery, if the patient is not fit for, for example, this tumor, is around, I think, 6 centimeters tumor. This is one of a patient, you can say on extreme top left, April 2017, this is last tumor, and by July, you can, you could not see any tumor there. So this is, these are all our patients. I have not taken any patient from, any photograph from the internet. These are all our data. This is a old, uh, I think 80 year old, a retired income tax commissioner. He had a severe uh, COPD and he underwent CABD. His ejection fraction was 50 to 20 percent. And because of this tumor, which was a large lung tumor, it was invading the sternum and going towards the arch of aorta. His ejection fraction was 15 20 percent. He has severe pain. He was referred to us from our medical oncology colleague uh -huh. because he is not at 15 20 percent. We can't give him a chemotherapy or palliative. So, this patient we did the radio surgery, and this is the uh, around three months follow up. He lived for one and a half years. His expected life expectancy according to his comorbidities and Charleston index was around three months. He was having severe pain. He was referred not for the treatment of cancer but for the severe pain that mass was causing eroding the sternum. And he lived for one and a half years. These are the other patients you can see a very large tumor on the chest right side and these are the lizards post radio surgery. This is a very interesting case. He is an athlete in the Haryana police. He had a tumor at the uh, left lung apex which was eroding the D2-D3 vertebra and also going to the D2-D3 ribs. So this was in May 2019. He is a very tall guy, with, he is an athlete, he is in the Haryana police uh, and he is a basketball player from that police quota. And we treated this patient with radio surgery. This is the January 2020 result, 2021 result. It was August 2022 and he, his only complaint is he complains of pain because the tumor was going into the D2-D3 vertebra, it is eating. So it is a technically T4 tumor and in T4 tumor even surgery, even he is fit but he can, nobody can do a surgery for T4 tumor. A T4 tumors which are invading the vertebra, nobody can, there is no surgery like, there is no surgery which is being done in India to replace that vertebra. And, um, and uh, this patient came last week, he's still doing fine, we have the pet city also. The only complaint is he had a diaphragmatic palsy, asymptomatic, since he's an athlete, he can compensate, he's an asymptomatic diaphragmatic palsy which we reported in the journal of radio surgery. So you can see, you can see on the uh, extreme left, extreme right, the left side hemidiaphragm is raised very high. Can you appreciate this? Yeah. This heavy diaphragm you can see on the right side, the liver, left side is raised up. Patient is not aware about the um, uh, diaphragmatic palsy because he is an athlete, he has compensated. And we have, and Deepak has published the guidelines how to delineate the phrenic nerve because in this, if you see the phrenic nerve was very close to the tumor. The, till now, there is no guidelines to uh, how to protect the phrenic nerve because our focus was totally on the tumor, phrenic nerve was but it was, it was the least thing which came to our mind and frankly it did not came to our mind that we have to save the phrenic nerve also. Till now there were no guidelines, so we have given the guidelines, Deepak has given this guideline how to delete the uh, phrenic nerve in case of these tumors. This is also a very interesting page, uh, patient a retired CRP of commanding, he is around 1939 board, 80 years. 
he has a tumor in the lung along the mediastinum. So he is a technically patient with a lung tumor with mediastinal lymph nodes. So for when, whenever there is a mediastinal lymph node with a lung tumor, the standard treatment is chemo radiation. That means the six weeks of radiation along with a low dose of chemotherapy. That is the standard treatment. But at 80 years, nobody was willing to give him a chemotherapy. And we know a, a low dose radiation, that the conventional radiation is not very effective. So I counseled the patient, I took the patient to a tumor board, we discussed, we deliberated, we fought with our medical oncology colleagues. They were insisting, we go for standard radiation. Why do you go for radiosurgery? There is no evidence. I said, yes, there is no evidence, but uh, let us try. I convinced the patient, I convinced their family. And this is still now four years, the patient is doing totally fine. Now he has a raised PSA. You can see this is August and this last one the patient came. So four years follow uh, stays three patient only with radio surgery go to the primary tumor and to the basal lymph node and doing asymptomatic. Now coming to the second important is prostate cancer. So be before 1980s, prostate uh, the radiation was much inferior. This is a poor guy radiation as compared to the surgery. But with after 80s, with the advancement in the technology, with computers, with computing, with calculations, with software, so it is possible. So why radiation was inferior? First question, why radiation was inferior before 80s? Because we cannot, because prostate is sandwiched between the bladder and the rectum. So if you give a very high dose to the prostate, either you will burn the rectum or bladder. So that's why we could not give a dose more than 60, 64 gray. Uh, before 80s. So that was the problem with uh, uh, old technology. But with the advancement in the technology, with advancement in computer science, computing, newer uh, machines and MLCs, so it is possible to escalate the dose. So this poor guy became stronger. But now the problem was the treatment of the prostate cancer with radiation was for around 8 weeks. That means patient has to stay in the near the hospital or has to come to the hospital for 2 months. Five days every day for two months. So there were some trials done to shorten the duration. It came down to from eight weeks to six weeks, one and a half months. So outstation patient staying in uh, other city for one and a half months. That's a very big time. So then this gentleman came to our OPD. He said, "I'm a businessman. I play in the morning. I golf. I don't want to compromise. I have my business. I cannot devote one and a half months coming every day to the hospital." So can you shorten my treatment duration? So when we left, uh, when we saw he was a uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer. So whenever we talk of prostate cancer, apart from staging, there is very important thing is risk categorization. Either it can be a low risk, it can be intermediate risk, it can be a high risk. So staging is included in this. So whenever anybody talks about prostate cancer, ask him which risk category: low, intermediate, or high risk. Staging to baat baat hai. Staging is included in this. So he was an intermediate risk. Uh, category. So with the radio surgery, either with cyber knife, other technologies, with radio surgery, this six weeks can be shortened to five days. On the extreme right, you can see the prostate with the radiation, and you can see innermost there is a yellow spot, yellow circle. That is the urethra. So it is how beautiful you can spare the urethra. With. That means you are giving very high dose to the prostate at the same time you are sparing the urethra because if there is a destruction of the prostate parenchyma it doesn't matter it is only when you are destroying the urethra then is the problem so this new technology can lead to a very high dose to the prostate and at the same time spare the urethra so this poor guy became stronger now is very strong and this is for sure this is the uh, not to give because I have the radio biological explanation of getting this stronger. So there are now trials, there are now evidence which says uh, more than 94-5% 10 year control rates, disease free survival in case of low to intermediate risk prostate cancer. So a patient of 60-65 whom there is a 95% possibility that he can live without disease for 10 years. Uh, I will not offer a surgery, I will offer a radio surgery for such patients. So whenever the low or intermediate risk goes to a urologist, he says I will take out the prostate, the uh, disease is gone forever. 
and they will tell, I will show you randomized trials, they will, uh, urologists, they will say, I will show you so many trials, they are, um, the patients are very good, they are doing um, much better than radiation. There is something called a genre effect. Actually, John West is what the company in the US in around 70s, they, they used to give bad fish and they used to say that we reject 9 fish and then we select out of 10 fish, we select 1 fish and reject 9 fish. So this is the John West effect. That means the urologists, they are screening 10 patients and rejecting 9 patients who are having a high risk pattern and they are selecting 1 patient which is very uh, fit. So this is the John West. So whenever you see a urology data, there is a John West effect. It is. It is. Uh, uh, there is a European Euro oncology publication. They also emphasize that there is a lot of John West effect in all the urological data when you talk about the prostate robotic radio surgery, robotic surgery. So when you remove the John West effect, this is the. This is what you get. I mean to say, there was a big trial. That is called PROTECT trial published in NEGM. Everybody knows NEGM. This was this PROTECT trial was published in NEGM in 2017. So it has low intermediate risk prostate cancer. This randomized trial. It has got three arms. One is active surveillance. Kuch nahi karna, watch karna. Active surveillance. Other arm was uh, normal radiation. Third arm was surgery. At the end of 10 years, surgery was not better than active surveillance in terms of overall survival. Jitte log, uh, 10 years pe jiye hai, surgery se hi active surveillance. If you don't do anything, then also patient will survive. If you do surgery, if you do radiation, then also patient will survive. At the end of 10 years, survival was equal in all the, whether you do surgery, whether you do radiation, whether you don't do anything. In low intermediate, there was no difference in uh, outcome at the end of 10 years. So, when surgery or radiation is not in, is superior to active surveillance, then why don't we keep all patients on active surveillance? This is the point which comes to when there is no advantage in overall survival at 10 years, why don't we keep all patients of low to intermediate risk prostate cancer on active surveillance? But if you see this graph, this table, So if you can see this green is for active surveillance and these upper uh, to talk to um, the red and blue are for the surgery or radiation. So all those overall survival at the end of 10 years was same but most uh, more patient in the active surveillance developed metastasis although it was not lethal. Patient did not die but patient had pain, patient had suffering, patient had mental agony. So it makes sense of early risk and intermediate risk to treat them not to do active surveillance. I am not in favor of active surveillance for any patient because for active, when you say active surveillance, then every 3 months, 6 months you have to do an MRI. If there is an increase in PSE, you do a biopsy. You give a lot of mental agony to the patient. So active surveillance is out. Radiation and uh, surgery both are equal in terms of even controlling the metastasis. Yeah, running out of time, two, three okay. minutes. Okay, right. so, so this is a very interesting data base A trial in the um, recently published in US, uh, in UK, comparing radio surgery versus um, uh, uh, radio surgery versus robotic surgery. At the end of two years, what you can see, forty nine percent patients were having uh, diapers versus two percent. So this is the transformation journey. I will skip this. Uh, very interesting is uh, kidney cancers. Kidney cancer was thought to be radio resistant, but the radio surgery doses is radio resistant to normal radiation, not to radio surgery. Radio surgery can overcome the resistance. This is one of the editorials which we published, and I will show you. Even if you see the report, ten-year outcome of kidney cancers, patients who are medically inoperable, kidney cancers, ten-year. This is a Japan, Japanese data. This is not a Chinese data. This is a Japan data. Ten years uh, experience. Local control 94%, local region control 88%, disease specific survival 96%. These are few of our patients which we treated for the kidney cancer. You can see pre and post, pre and post, there is absolute um, removal of the FDG ability. 
In this patient, on the left side is a young patient. On the right side, you can see he was medically uh, had a medical comorbidity. There is no activity. And now, uh, just coming on to liver transplant, it is in liver uh, cancers, liver transplant is the standard, but if the tumor is going to portal vein tumor, portal vein, it is a contraindication for liver transplant. In such case, radiosurgery can do a lot of wonders. So this is our this is our publication in the transplant journal. That means with because if the patient is if the tumor has gone to the portal vein, it is a palliative case. But we have shown that around 56 percent of the patients were downstairs and they were made operable, and they underwent liver transplant. It's very good. I think this is also. So, uh, this is the last slide. So, whenever you talk about radio surgery, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and um, the uh, kidney cancer, they should come into mind. If there is any patient, you also always think about radio surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you. Best of our capabilities, and we want to give the best to our patients. So, uh, my question, Dr. Shyam, here is, uh, of course, in lung, thoracic uh, oncology, lung SBRT, as far as I remember, in West also, 30% of the tumors, solitary tumors, may not be biopsy. Yes. So, so we can safely go ahead once we have the calculated data. So, as per you, once we have the calculated data, this is the most proper diagnosis of malignancy. So, in India also, we can go ahead because in general, when we were in our early days, we used to say that no, no diagnosis would be made. So there is a paradigm shift here. So what's your view? So uh, because every day uh, most of the patients, even we also see a lot of patients who have uh, on even after the COVID, we see a lot of patients because they underwent a CT scan for the COVID changes. So now the detection of collateral permanent reduces and increase many fold. So now there are a lot of patients who went for the COVID and they have now have a uh, solitary pulmonary nodule. If the nodule size is 1 to 2 centimeters, they are calculated and then they go for a PET scan, they say we don't but we'll biopsy. Needle da denge to cancer chhed denge to kar jayega. And they go for a PET scan. We see many patients who come with a PET scan without a biopsy. And then they don't want to do any surgery because they went for something else and they have been detected with something else. They went for COVID lung uh, improvement and they are now having a lung, uh, doctor is saying you have a lung cancer. So empirically they are now calculators available which can give a pretext possibility of malignancy. If it is more than 65 or uh, 70, 75, you can go for empirical SVRT. That is now standard. We have done a lot of cases uh, with empirical SVRT. And uh, second is that of course we are all as very because we are taking on uh, different equipments. So why would CyberMite be more we're better equipped in terms of time treating on a midnight with, with best available? Yeah. Uh, very interesting question. For lung tumors, I don't treat on CyberMite. I treat on Linac. For uh, Deepak showed for brain, for trigeminal neuralgia. Note, it is the CyberMite because the target is 3 mm, 4 mm. Uh, I have seen Gavanaik also. I have asked the people in the Gavanaik to make a plan and see. If you see the Gavanaik literature, it gives a lot of uh, dose to the brain. Itself. So, for particular indication, the, like trigeminal neuralgia, very small targets in the brain, very uh, like liver area where you cannot, uh, which are movable. So, there are certain indications where cyanide, there is nothing comparable to cyanide, but lung, there are many indications, but still there are almost 50% indication where you can treat with non cyanide also a lunac SBRT that do. Uh, because I treat most of the patients on lung cancer on non cyanide radio surgery. Great, great, thank you. And Dr. Deepak, I just want to ask one question. Uh, what is the difficulty which we face uh, when we are treating, treating brain stem metastasis? Uh, technically, I'm just talking about so, brain stem metastasis is the most important, uh, most important problem in brain stem because there is certain tolerance which is defined. Mm -hmm. If you, you cannot exceed exceed that tolerance, you exceed that tolerance, you end up giving a lot of toxicity. So, in many cases, if required, instead of giving single fraction, we try to give three to five fractions so that we do not produce any toxicity instead of control. Because creating any toxicity, there are many important critical symptoms which are located in the brain stem which control the heart, the and if you produce that those are toxicity, then it's because of So it's important to keep in mind the tolerance of brain stem 
how much far you can go, how much low you can sell. Sometimes you have to achieve, uh, if you want to give a single fraction, you have to give a lower dose, which is, may not be sufficient to control the business. So right. better is to give in three to five fractions to achieve that kind of control. Thank you, thank you. And one more point, I would just like to make. Uh, most of the time when patient is having cancer, he develops brain metastasis. So previously we all used to do whole brain addition in which eventually the neurological uh, quality of the patient uh, was deteriorated. But now slowly steadily we are, are treating with only the serotactic radio surgery to those lesions, which is eventually patient is able to lead a good quality of life and can go ahead with the systemic therapy very sooner rather than getting a treatment of over two to three weeks the patient's treatment is finished in two, maybe two days, three days and then you can go ahead for the systemic therapy. The cognition is also important especially in case of brain stem because uh, before the era of immunotherapy and this all chemotherapy the survival of patient who is having the brain stem is probably six months or nine months now this, uh, these patients are living three years, four years, five years with all sorts of immunotherapy so that becomes more important to share more of the uh, critical area, the focus so that cognition and education should be maintained. So, uh, ask the question. Yeah. Just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, after uh, this uh, introduction by our monitor, uh, there are some questions from the audience, and sir, those questions do not feel offended. They may not agree with your point of view, but but still, but no, no, Dr. Deepak, they are they are still important for everyone. All right. Uh, so we have Dr. Mita, who is an eminent neurosurgeon at PSRI. He has his point of view and a question. Oh, I, I just would like to introduce myself. I have done a one year stereotactic radio surgery at UVA, USA. And I have done on gamma knife and lenaco. So uh, both of them are my alma mater. I, I have done my MS general surgery from KGMC and both are from KGMC. So well done. Uh, good of luck for all the things, but there are certain things they need to clear actually. So, first of all, uh, let me say they did an excellent job and they are still doing an excellent job. There are certain things you need to clear it up. I am a neurosurgeon. I am also a uh, uh, trained in a stereotactic radio surgery. So, let me tell you that uh, there has been a controversy with gamma knife and cyber knife for gone. So, both of them are comfort, it is comfortable. There is nothing called as one is excellent and other is not. So both are comparable and let me tell you even with gamma knife you can do a now a fractionated therapy with a face mask. There is no need of any kind of uh, frame. What we call it is a frame mask and even what they told is a frame, it is a face mask which is used for cyber knife. Though the robot dance here and there but that dance doesn't matter. Because gamma knife is an array of beams which is there of cobalt and you can block the radio surgery wherever you want whether it is brainstem or not and I have seen the things getting it done from my very own eyes with my own practical experience it is done very well everything can be done but there are some things which you need to understand he cleared it up very clearly that like in optic nerve compression in case of pituitary adenoma you cannot treat it with SRS the reason being it requires immediate decompression otherwise the eyesight will be lost and it will be lost forever let me tell you any kind of radiation which you give to brain or anywhere in the body I think everybody knows radiation is injurious so we know it does create an injury in brain only the problem is when it is going to show itself. So the effects of any kind of radiation comes between 16 to 18 months or 20 months, not before that. So let me tell you the patient will go hard and hard, healthy when you do a radiation. And probably after maybe let's say 6 months, 8 months, even 12 months down the lane, will come with symptoms which you might require a surgery. Whether it is, let's say, radiation for a uh, tumor, for a metastasis, they can create a what you call an adverse reaction which is called a radiation necrosis. So, radiation necrosis can cause edema, sudden edema, which can cause sudden brain compression or midline shift and you will 
only requires surgery during that time. Nothing else can save the patient's life. So these are simple things which are there. But yes, radio surgery has changed the game plan for a lot of tumors. And he correctly said even for meningiomas. Now the thing is that I have myself a paper for asymptomatic meningioma in surgery, neurosurgery journal, which is the topmost neurosurgery journal of of this entire international uh, acumen and we have done 500 cases I have reported that that is on my name the other is on what he was talking about the non-functioning pituitary adenoma again uh, SRS works fine with a functioning pituitary adenoma but non-functioning it's dubious I was impressed by what you sh showed me on cavernous I probably believe that cavernous what he showed as tremors what I believe is he created a functional effect by affecting the functional nucleus because cavernous uh, uh, cavernoma or cavernous angiomas which are supposedly called are supposedly resistant to uh, stereotactic radio surgery. This is still now. So I have got one more video of the patient. No, just a minute, just a minute. Let me come in. So the other thing which is more important, I think uh, even he had spoken about uh, just uh, doing a stereotactic radio surgery on a PET scan. So all of us here know that PET scan is bright for an infective lesion, also for a metastatic lesion. So both lesions will show that same kind of effect until unless there is something specific to it. So we are hopeful even for cranial only for brainstem in children, what we call as lyomas, we uh, subject them primarily to SRS without biopsy. Otherwise, we always ask the patient to get a biopsy done, whether it is an intracranial meningioma or not. But yes, in intracranial meningioma, most are asymptomatic. What my paper suggests was 90% uh, survival with a good improvement without surgery. In those we included, either non-operative asymptomatic or operative where we have reduced it but there is a residual meningioma so there are a lot of great points there are nothing like that right and wrong but yes if it fits the patient as they said then we should subject to radio surgery in the patient has uh, uh, comorbid uh, medical conditions if surgery is not provided but there is ever a tussle between radio surgery and even a surgery. Surgery needs to be done only for immediate results because radio surgery most of the time will show the results only after a period of weight, which is at times up to 18 months in case of meningioma. And let me tell you, even in meningioma or in acoustic schwannoma, if the patient, we tell them very clearly, if the patient there is no control of the tumor or if there is edema, then we need to do again the surgery. So we have to caution them on this mind that radio surgery though looks very lucrative because it is non-invasive, non-scalpel based, it is going to have a future. Definitely. So I would like to just, 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 just a minute. So uh, very, very, very kindly and very good presentation. They, they deserve the right for rebuttal yes, or, yes. or, or for an answer. Dr. Yes. Shah, yeah. please. First of all, please, sir, uh, with all due regards, we have good experience, we have a lot of yeah. With regard to radio necrosis. Radio necrosis is the phenomena which is seen, which is seen in cases of like uh, glioma's. In case of glioma, we have done surgery, where then we give radiation and uh, then we give chemotherapy, that is pseudo progression of radio necrosis. Yes. And when radio necrosis in brainstem is increased with the targeted therapies, but they are ways now they are uh, different ways like we give a 10 cc, 10 grade. They are now constrained defined where you can prevent radio necrosis. Radio necrosis, we want the radio necrosis within the tumor. We want it. We don't want radio necrosis outside the tumor. So now they are even um, volumetric data uh, guidelines how to prevent radio necrosis. Now things have changed a lot. Uh, how to prevent it. So the radio necrosis we want within the tumor. We want the tumor to get necrosis for the tumor. But we don't want necrosis around the tumor. And now there are different ways. So that is the beauty of when we are spreading the radiation. It's like we spread radiation from all different directions. We see because they used to be a lot of radio necrosis previously but it has reduced. 
uh, tremendously data yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not zero. Yeah, no, not zero. It's not zero. That's huh. what you need to. Have yes. Yeah. So it's not zero. It may be maybe around a fraction of percent, but still there is a lot of penny operative mortality also after surgery. Yeah. So yeah. It is equal. Yeah. But with data process, patient uh, rarely dies. And secondly, regard. And secondly, regarding. Uh, there are some specific indications where even the neurosurgical neuro guideline says you go for radio surgery, small acoustic trauma, they say either wait or go for radio surgery. Now in our department, Medanta, radio surgery also is aims also, majority of acoustic trauma who's grade 1, 2 and 3, they go for radio surgery. The neuro, uh, our cyanide brain part, 70% is managed by radiation oncologists, 30% of the load is from neuro surgery. All who's grade 1, 2, 3, uh, last week we were discussing, we will start a randomized trial of giving the radio surgery for acoustic chronoma. So acoustic chronoma, neurosurgeons have stopped operating because it is adhered to the acoustic nerve, 7th, 8th nerve. You remove it, you will have a facial palsy um, in most around. There are 60% facial palsy reported in last who's grade 4, you would agree. So even, uh, so next, so, uh, next point coming to me. So not all, I think, can, can you, uh, any patient, I can ask, can you? Guarantee your patient. The first of all, there are neurosurgical guidelines which say small acoustic Deepak showed small acoustic trauma. Either you wait. When we are saying that you wait for acoustic trauma, small surveillance, the option like sir. Yes. Huh? So surveillance. Uh, okay. He has showed me surveillance. Either you do a surveillance for small acoustic trauma, two grade one, intracranicular, or you go for a radio surgery. Right. For large. Definitely, he said for a large, which is compressing, which is causing hydrocephalus, which is causing a paralysis, which is causing edema. So there is no replacement. There is no replacement for surgery. Surgery has to be done there in those cases. But small acoustic trauma. Now, on 90% of our cases of the neurosurgeon, they break small for radio surgery. Now, coming on to the gamma life. In gamma life, we see a lot of literature regarding the gamma life in primary neuralgia. All UCLA uh, um, data. All uh, Miami data, they say the brainstem goes to the in trigeminal neuralgia is 25 kg, which means a lot of numbness. When you give a trigeminal neuralgia with a high dose, you give a very really high dose to the uh, brainstem also. So, this is because sector blocking, we cannot further modify. So you agree in a sector blocking? No, you, uh, you cannot. So, UCLA data says. Lord, you have Ponziolka, you have seen the paper. Yes, what the maximum of Ponziolka? Ponziolka and So, can I So, it is not from UCA. Yeah. Yeah. Not from UCA, but I think it was the brain step goes back to 25 grade with the gamma knife, whereas it was Simon I, it will be talk about 12 grade. And they are definitely and uh, I think it's, it's getting one to one, and they need to discuss it over dinner. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Parashar has a question. Uh, I have a question as well as a comment. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, our questions should or comments should not be longer than the talk. So, uh, I would request all of us so you to want say, say, you uh, want to say, sir, Monday should not be longer than Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Second part is that, yes, uh, in all the ways you should we have, have all the specialties co-existing, the radiation oncology, the medical oncology, and as well as the uh, surgical and neurosurgical oncologies. So we have few more boards there to resolve the issues which arise. So no problem there, there are protocols and protocols are always evolving. So uh, every day is a new thing, today this contract is winning, tomorrow that side might be winning. So that, that should not be the context. The other thing I want to tell you is that sometimes we have almost every second day a uh, situation where patient comes with PET CT scan positive tumor. You either can't subject it to biopsy, or is subjected to biopsy and it comes repeatedly negative. So what we uh, generally consider is three times we have taken a biopsy and it is coming out negative. In my area, base, base of tongue is a difficult area. You take biopsy as many times, sometimes it comes negative three times. So eventually the, uh, the uh, concept of calculator, Mayo's calculator, still if someone can elaborate more, because what happens to the typical patient is the patient gets negative biopsy report, he is happy despite the fat uh, uh, CD positive thing and then goes to the tumor board and tumor board says no, our calculation says you should have to go proper treatment, whether it is surgery or uh, radiation or whatever. So now patient is confused. Over here we are people who are more connected to the patients in everyday practice. So just please for their, explain, their uh, benefit explain how it is important and what are the criteria we include in the calculator so that they can explain to the patient when patient comes back that the negative biopsy will be 
Right, sir. So regarding the calculator, uh, so my message is not should be any PET scan which is lighting up in India TV is very common. You see a lot of red lumens lighting up. So it is a solitary permanent just calculator take into account the lesion size at what interval it is growing. It's not like on a single spot PET CT you go for a uh, radio surgery. And the speculation very important cancers all the metastases as Sir said metastases can be there. Metastases are normally in the lung grounded uh, and the primary is speculated, the group of others are speculated. So they take into account the location, the speculation, the uh, volume increase on serial progression, the size increase in progression, like what spot after 6 weeks or 8 weeks, we repeat it uh, and location and history of smoking, very important, history of smoking. I think some point of time they will also include the pollution also. And the doubling time, they are very and FDK routine PET scan. So they take around 6-7 uh, parameters to count and then they give Historical data about cancers in that particular area. Yes sir. So the history data. Yes, cancer. So all these things are taken into account and then calculated. So this calculator has sufficient power to discriminate whether this is a tuberculosis, whether it is a brain loma, because they will not have speculation. They will not keep on increasing doubling. And they will not help in the spoke. So they are. Uh, this is ICLC, International uh, Lung Cancer, and this is this uh, American Chest Physician. They are they are guidelines. They are not my guidelines. Not I am not recommending. It is because now we have a tool. Sir, this is only for lung. This is for lung. It's not for. This is this uh, calculator is only for the lung. This because solitary pulmonary nodule in lung. Now there are guidelines that we start changing from 5 mm nodule, you keep on changing it. So if you calculate, if you just write Mio calculator, the empirical SBRT, it will give even put any of your patients. Dr. Saxena sir. This is a very important question. Right, sir. Dr. Sir, some of us are here from the public sector enterprises and we defer our patient now. So if you could just give an idea of the cost, does the patient have to sell his flat? So, 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 the, so, the, cost, the cost, the cost of normally it depends on number of fraction. If it is a one fraction, it is close to 2.5 million rupees. Planning, treatment, CT scans, and for three fraction, that number three. Sir, mic use it. Mic. And for five fraction, it is somewhere close to 2.5 million. So, it varies from 2.5 to 3.5 million. Three million is normal. Five Doctor uh, Bhalla. Just like to add one thing, uh, we were asking about other treatments of IGI. So the range starts from 1 lakh rupees to 3 lakh rupees. So in general, that will depend on the case to case basis and number of radiation which you are doing. So minimum cost, so somewhere like in setup to setup it differs. But generally it starts from maybe 80,000, 90,000, like in our setup, and then Google you know, goes up just and according to the technology which you are using. So studio taxi, everyone is doing at a different level. Cyber knife cost and the IGI cost. So, you don't need to sell your kidneys and fat for that. Dr. Bala, sir. Sir, we lost a patient of neurocystocyposis, multiple foci in the brain. So, in that particular case, uh, radio surgery was uh, possible? No. I think we can write no. There's, there's only the thing is that when you said multiple uh, neurocystocyposis, only we can do that accessible areas we try to excise and rest is medical therapy. There is no radio surgery for that. Next. Hey, Dr. Saxena, Dr. Saxena. We are coming to you, sir. We are coming to you. Sir, in the patient uh, which you showed that uh, he had a solitary tumor and the biopsy was impossible, uh, I'm sure in a big hospital set up like yours, you would have, you would have contemplated an endobronchial ultrasound guided biopsy or a transesophageal. Was it considered or was it not possible? No, that was the uh, right effects. It's quite yeah. away from the end. Secondly, the patient has severe uh, COPD. They refused the biopsy also. They were having this in the previous because the patient 
was expected to have uh, the infection. They, if they were treating this from last six to eight months. They were not going for. We see many patients who refused for biopsy. But uh, this lesion is very possible. When the patient refuses because the intubation radiologist will explain there is a high risk of having a pneumothorax. You could land up to the ICU also. So many times, they do, but endotropical in that peripheral is very, is quite away. It's not possible. But we do a lot of endotropical biopsies also. And the uh, uh, second set of sonal question about the prostate. You said that whatever you attempt, I've seen lots of prostate patients, even without uh, uh, surgery, uh, they live up to eight and ten years. Uh, this is what I showed you today. Trial at ten years, low intermediate. If you don't do anything, also they will live ten years. Ten years. Doctor, Doctor Nalanda Singh sir, and then we go to Doctor Tulsi and Doctor Amrita. Doctor Shah, I want to yes, ask you a question. There is a patient of cancer of prostate. Right. There is no metastasis, and uh, there are. What do you advise? Whether there should be a surgical treatment or radiation therapy? So first, so I refer it to you. So first of all, I will try to just categorize the patient. What risk? Low risk, intermediate, high risk. If the patient is 85 year plus. Low risk patient. I will ask them to observe. Okay. In case if the patient observe with the PSA, not even with MRI, we will keep on observing. If the patient is 70, 75 years and comes to be a low risk patient, a 75 year old, a low risk patient, the guidelines say you can go for active surveillance also. In active surveillance, there is agony. Her team has has to go for an MRI or um, or uh, the six month MRI. If the case is leading, you go for a biopsy. That is a mental. So I will not. So I will. It, it's a PSA proven case. PSA. In the then finally. So P, so P, but, yeah. but you will do surgery if I refer the case to you, or will you do radiation therapy three times? Uh, about 60 years, I will go for radio surgery. If a young patient, sometimes you see BRCA positive, aggressive young patient, 55 year old. In that patient, I will go for a surgery. Otherwise, 60 years and above, I will go for radio surgery. Okay. In low to intermediate, in high risk patient, we have to go combine hormone also. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Doctor. Doctor Dulsi sir, sir, five minutes for you. Five minutes for Doctor Kalra. Sir. <laughs> it is, it is, it is 10:35. We finish at 10:45, sir. <laughs> thank you, Doctor uh, So the chair can have a chair there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Plenty of Sir, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Quickly. Okay. So, very quickly, as Dr. Chuan said, so to all of you, or to any of you, the future of radiation oncology is likely that uh, in future all RTs would be automated, personalized, and hypofractionated. So, this is not me. This is what the ESTO 2022 said. And uh, to quote them further, probably uh, uh, automated therapy and the hypofractionated therapy, which is a cyber knife therapy, is the uh, you know radiation of choice today. What do you say, sir? So hypofractionation. Normally, the conventional fractionation is when we are giving a two units of radiation per day. For example, head neck it goes for seven weeks, prostate it goes for eight days. So that is conventional fraction. So when we increase the number of dose per day. From five to six, uh, more than five gray or six gray per day, that is called hypo hypofractionation. So that will reduce the treatment time. And SBRT or radio surgery is the extreme form of radio surgery, extreme form of radiation where we are making it more than seven to eight units of. And this is hypofractionated. Yes. Yeah, so hy so S radio surgery is the one form of hypofractionation. So right. Uh, so because no, see in breast cancer the earlier treatment is like five weeks of treatment. Now we have got something called the pause forward in APPIP, 5 weeks we reduced to 5 days. Similarly, even now the trials are going on for 2 or 3 days also. In prostate from 8 weeks to 6 weeks to 5 days, now they are trials going on with MR for one single shot. So now it is trying to reduce the number of days to and uh, number of uh, dose to. We understand that. Sir, sir uh, talk us through the proton versus the photon therapy. Yes. So this is what? A photon therapy, the yes. cyber yes. has conveyed to the this photon therapy. Is, yes. What is the difference? Yes. This is on X-ray based. X-rays are photons. Photon. Photons. Yeah. Photons. Yes. So, so talk us through the photon versus the yeah. photon therapy. <laughs> okay, sir. Talk us through that. Yeah, this yeah, is okay. photon. As we understand, yes, sir. This is photon. This is X-ray. This is high energy X-ray. This is the highest kind of energy 
uh, the spectrum of the electromagnetic rays and it goes and you are targeting it to the tumor bed or tumor area and it passes through the body whatever structure it passes through it deposits some dose like it passes through the skin then it passes through the intestine then goes to the whatever target but eventually when you are giving radiation received by photons some amount of energy or radiation dose is deposited to the structures which are coming in the line fire while proton therapy, proton therapy is a charge, proton is a charge particle as all of us know. So it has a specific uh, peak which is called Bragg's peak. Bragg effect. Bragg, Bragg's peak. What happens is it just acts like a French bomb means you are targeting it to the tumor. So by passing through the other organs, it is, it is not depositing its dose. And once it reaches to the tumor, all of the dose is deposited there. Hence, it is acting uh, like a trench bomb and preventing the collateral damage to very very large extent which is not possible in the photons. That is the main effect, main difference. And plus sir, uh, like hypofractionation for general uh, physicians, sir, the hypofractionation is helping patients in the term because your logistics are easier now. Previously like in breast or other cases you had to come for 5 or 6 now the patient is coming 3 days. So his uh, uh, air to and fro of hairs are reduced, the, the stress is reduced, even patients who are travelling in Delhi from one point to point B, the traffic is also stressed. So suppose we have to travel two weeks lesser. So similarly, hypofraction is helping the patients. But hypofractionation therapy is as compared to the proton therapy, which is longer, maybe about six weeks or so. Is that true? Uh, so sir, you are uh, is there confusion between two things? Why do I see hypofractionation versus normal fractionation? In normal fractionation, we give a two units of radiation. No, sir. No. I'm, I'm Photon versus photons, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So photons are X-rays, protons are the particle, charged particle, that means in the nucleus they are protons. Right? So this is so duration, the number of dose, everything remains same. In protons and photons, when we are talking about convection, because the what you call radiobiological effect RBE is same for uh, is for photons is one, for proton is 1.1. So technically, practically same. So uh, my, they are my colleagues which are there in protons, Gambolo Chennai. So if they want to treat a breast or prostate, any other, they will take the same amount of days, same amount of duration, right? So uh, same amount of duration, like four weeks, six weeks, whatever it is taking. The, and if you talk about it, uh, hypofractionation, it can be done there also, here also. Hypofractionation decreases the treatment duration, whether it is protons or photons. When you are comparing protons and photons, it has two different modalities. We are comparing the only advantage, practical, theoretical advantage is decrease in side effects, that means exit dose. If the car will stop here, it will not overshoot. This is proton. Uh, if in photons, it will stop, it will slide uh, through. My last question to you would be regarding effective treatment protocol. I said last question. Effective treatment protocol for glioblastomas. Yes. So you know, as we know, they are very you know radio resistant. So uh, can you prolong with cyclonide? No. I mean, you cannot. In case of glioblastoma. Um, um, yes. First is maximum safe resection or gross total resection. Right, sir. Okay. Yeah. First is that. And then we follow with conventional radiation and chemo. Along with oral chemotherapy, yes. followed, followed by burning it off chemotherapy. Oral right. chemotherapy. Right. In case of recurrence, if it is a localized recurrence, if it is not surgically salvageable, then you go for mid death uh, cyclonide. So I don't mean only cyclonide, any relax which can give a shorter duration of radiation, precise focused radiation for shorter duration can be tried. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kanda, sir. Sir, I, I understand, sir, you want to say I, I should take half the time, half the time than Dr. Tusi, and I will take probably lesser than that, sir. Uh, maybe because of uh, some uh, gamma radi radiation in my uh, throat. Sir, <coughs> alpha, beta, gamma rays have been revived uh, uh, in due course of time. So, I think they, they have their own utility. So at places alpha rays, at places beta, and at places gamma rays, at places the uh, protons, they are useful. So we have to select the case accordingly. So it may be best for one thing and not best for the other one, sir. It is always known to us. So I just wanted to know 
as you said that trigeminal neuralgia. So in, in that case, what was your first modality of the choice? Uh, trigeminal neuralgia, first trigeminal neuralgia, I am not saying it should not be taken that you should go, you are in radiology first day. Pharmacological treatment is the first line of treatment. Right. And sir, uh, about uh, SBRT and SDRT, there are differences and there are uh, some confusions. So, SBRT is when we do a radio surgery extra payment, it is called SBRT or SABR, stereotactic ablative surgery, SBRT, and SDRT is the, I showed one the lung, uh, lung tumor, we gave a single fraction, that is SDRT, single dose RT. Yeah, that was very much popular. Nice therapy. A flash therapy is different when we do very high uh, radiation in a uh, form of grids. Very high in the form of grids, they are usually used in a very large tumor where you divide it into multiple small grids. That's called grid therapy, flash therapy. So that is mainly right now experimental and mainly in palliative therapy. My, my friends will be remembering me with SDRT, Rampal, Arjun Rampal, mother. In Portuguese, it was at that time yes. five or seven years back. So, yeah. So, so uh, protection with balloon for uh, radiotherapy for uh, uh, prostate. Are you using frequently, or it is only for some cases? Uh, in case of when we do a SBRT or radio surgery of the prostate with cyclines, we can achieve. But right now, we are doing it only five fractions. Now I showed in, if you see the slide where there was a bodybuilder, extreme left there was a, a small slide where they were giving a single fraction. When we give a very single fraction then they are using, but many centers in the US are using the balloons or chair. Uh, and it is required because with the correct five fraction you can achieve the dose, we can save the item. Maintaining the so, I, I wish to have more interaction in next meeting with you. Right. Uh, friends, uh, I think it's, a, it's time to give a big hand to our monitor and, and the wonderful speaker, Dr. Kamke, uh, please tell Dr. Dino Gupta and our wonderful monitor, Dr. Uh, Ritesh uh, Sarmasar. Uh, Dr. Ritesh, uh, uh,